right. As uh, Dr. Coble reminded me, you can't go home again, but we'll, we'll try not to uh, let that get in the way of this evening's presentation. I want to first off, I want to thank Ben and Sam and everybody for bringing me back home for a short stay and a chance to talk to everybody and see some familiar faces and, of course, some familiar turf. Uh, I'm going to talk about the conservation title. Uh, but, uh, you know, old habits die hard, so you might notice I'm making a bit of an argument through this presentation, so I'm going to blend in a couple things like history and maybe a little bit of politics, so bear with me as we, as we go through it. But uh, we're going to talk policy, farm bill, and um, politics. So Dr. Coble kind of tipped, tipped, uh, started this discussion off. Uh, farm bill, uh, written in very polarized times. This is the 2018 uh, House midterm election results as reported by the New York Times. We know this very familiar red and blue map. Uh, as Dr. Coble mentioned, and as many of you know, the Farm Bill was a very bipartisan final vote count. So this is an accomplishment that uh, we should take some pride in, and we should also uh, take some moments to think through and learn some of the uh, lessons that we get out of this to, re to achieve something that's bipartisan that is a massive piece of legislation that spends roughly a trillion dollars over 10 years and touches, as has been mentioned, about every life in this country. Uh, to pull this off in this kind of environment was no easy task. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, another way to look at the electoral map, and I'm not sure why the words come up like that, but this is the 2016 presidential election uh, map by Princeton University. This is a fun 3D map that'll rotate and all kinds of neat stuff. But basically the size of the tower is representative of uh, the number of voters. And so this is also something we know in the political realm uh, from agriculture is the tough political realities when we start counting votes in Congress across ur urban and rural uh, uh, sectors of the country. And how have we done this? As mentioned, we've built a coalition over many, many years, and we have worked very hard to maintain it at times uh, as political pressures have worked to almost tear it apart. And that, that coalition is really a three-part uh, coalition. It's the Farm Coalition, the regional interests around farm support policy. It is the Food Assistance Coalition, uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program that provides food assistance to low-income families to feed themselves and their families. And of course, the environmental conservation side of this uh, that I'll talk about in more detail in the conservation title. And if we look back over history, right, the, the, this starts with the Farm Coalition in the 20s. We add food assistance in the 60s and really get around to conservation policy in the 80s. And uh, since that time, this is how we've been able to pull off relatively strong bipartisan efforts in Congress. This uh, is from the Congressional Budget Office. This is uh, our national debt as a percentage of GDP, looking back over the entire history of the United States. And as you can tell, we have ourselves a bit of debt. Uh, this is not a new issue, and this is not a new uh, topic, and I promise I'm not going to get into a budget or debt discussion in any kind of detail. But what I do want to use is to set up something. And it is the budget issues and the budget challenges that are, that are really operating in our political space that are changing the ability to write legislation. It changes how we write legislation. And it really complicates the politics as we go through. If we look at a farm bill, it was mentioned kind of where spending uh, takes place out of the farm bill. Uh, this looks back, Congressional Research Service put together this wonderful uh, chart a while back that looks at about 25 years of spending in the farm bill. And we can see over time the significant growth uh, in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the SNAP program, or used to be called food stamps, largely coming out of the 2008 recession when many people lost jobs or lost income. And so that counter-cyclical type program grew. We can see, as, as Dr. Coble pointed out, the big growth in crop insurance in the blue bars. We see the up and down uh, spending on the red part of the bar from Title I commodity programs. And then we see this steady incline over time uh, in conservation spending. And so these are the trends that we saw coming into this farm bill uh, and that we have been monitoring or dealing with as we go through an increasingly difficult political environment that is complicated more and more by budget challenges. Let's step back a little bit more. What about the history of the farm bill? This is, a, this is my attempt at graphs. So as a lawyer, I, I, working with a bunch of economists, they force me to do graphs. And so every once in a while, I have to make some. So here's my attempt to chart the market year average price for cotton, corn, and wheat for the entire 100-year history of, uh, of the farm bill, looking, and then adding the years looking ahead by the Congressional Budget Office. So we can see sort of the low price run that got us there in the Great Depression that really is the origin story of farm policy in the farm bill. Uh, the New Deal legislation of 1933 
in the depths of that depression, but farmers had actually been suffering depression issues for going on 12 years or so prior to that. And of course, conservation policy is also, uh, also originates at this point in time, although we really don't get around to a major conservation policy until the 80s, but the Dust Bowl, uh, the, the just tragic uh, Dust Bowl disaster of the 30s, also wraps into some of how we develop and begin writing farm bills in this country. And so this, this run of, of, of struggle and challenge in the 30s, we look to quite a bit as we talk about how the policy got started and what its roots look like, but also what are the lessons we pull out of, of how we got to where we are today. So building conservation policy. This is looking at the CRP. Ben mentioned the CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program. This is our longest running conservation policy. Um, we can trace the title of it all the way back to the 1956 Farm Bill. It is uh, tied a little bit to what we were doing in the 30s and early 40s during the, uh, the post-Dust Bowl realm. But it's really 1985's Farm Bill in which we create, recreated the CRP program and designed it specifically to take environmentally sensitive land out of production. So before 85, this program was largely kind of a, a, a component of price support policy. So we had loans out there trying to help support prices and we would use uh, conservation as one of the ways we'd pull acreage out of production and pay farmers to do so. The policy today as it stood uh, going into this farm bill and remain coming out of this farm bill is, is a land retirement policy. 10 to 15 year contracts that takes those acres out of production and uh, in return you get an annual rental payment from USDA. And uh, the 2014 farm bill capped this program at 24 million acres. So this map was reported by FSA uh, where those acres sat um, going into the farm bill. The other land retirement policy that we've created over time that is not part of CRP but is also out there and available are the easements. Where you can put a, you can have a permanent legal right on the property uh, that, that places an easement right on the property to do conservation. In particular, in the picture here, uh, dealing with wetlands. You can get an easement uh, that will help you restore and maintain wetlands on your property. Uh, groups like Ducks Unlimited and other uh, wildlife groups really are interested in programs like this to help restore habitat. Uh, and this is one way to make sure that habitat is not only restored on your property, but is maintained uh, going forward because the easement is a, uh, a right in that land that will run with the land and each sub subsequent owner will buy with that easement on it. If we look at uh, how we sort of um, added more conservation layers in the 80s. We can think of a challenge coming out of uh, budget issues, particularly coming out of the 70s and the Reagan administration in the 80s that was looking to cut spending. Again, we can see in the debates around this time the way that budget fight really complicated our politics. But at the same time, we were dealing with the farm crisis of the 80s and we were dealing with uh, a massive amount of, of expansion in planted acres in the 70s, which returned erosion concerns at the same time in our political realm, we saw a growth in the environmental movement and political power around things like the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, all created in the 70s. So by the time we got to the 1985 Farm Bill, we were struggling mightily on the farm. Our politics were struggling mightily, mightily with budget and spending issues and some difficult political environment. And uh, we formed up the remaining part of our coalition by bringing in the environmental interests through the Conservation Reserve Program as well as conservation compliance. So in 85, we created CRP, and as part of that deal, we added compliance. And I presume most of you in this room know what compliance is, but just to give it a brief overview, in order to be eligible for any payment under the USDA programs, you, your farm, has to be in compliance with two things. One of them is highly erodible lands. If that acreage is highly erodible, you must have a plan in place to control erosion on those acres. That is to protect that soil and keep it out of our waters and protect our waters as well. If you do not have that compliant, if you do not have your plan in place for highly erodible land, you are out of compliance and that needs to be addressed. You uh, will be ineligible for payments. And in fact, if you've been out of compliance for multiple years, you may owe money back for any payments you've received in that time frame. In a similar vein, wetlands compliance also added in 85, extended in 1990, uh, deals with whether or not the acreage on your farm was a wetland at any point in time. Now it's grandfathered usually from 1990, anything that was drained before 1990. After that point in time, if it was a wetland, you cannot farm on a, on a, a drained wetland and you cannot drain a wetland or you become ineligible. These are major 
major provisions in dealing with our farm programs and assistance. And I think it's also very notable that we saw these provisions come about in the fights of the 80s, that this was part of that deal to build the coalition broader and strengthen our ability to get through Congress in the 80s. So we can see some of the way this policy develops around the challenges that we see. What we've been developing, particularly in the, the more market-oriented years since 1996, is this idea of working lands conservation. So the CRP program takes acres out of production. Well, what we've also found is we need to be working with assistance on producing farms that's not taking acres out of production. So we began creating uh, working lands environmental or working lands conservation programs, beginning with the Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP. Uh, this is an attempt to show uh, the acres in the program as well as the uh, obligations as reported by USDA. So you can see some of the growth around this program. It's designed as cost share. This is the program where you go into the NRCS office and you can sign up for assistance, direct assistance to help offset the cost of, a, of putting in place a conservation practice. It has, uh, the farmer of course is going to pay the remaining amount of that. This is so far been significantly focused on livestock production. For the, those of you with livestock in the, uh, on your farm, this has been a program using uh, federal funds to help uh, improve manure management, for example. Uh, it helps put in grass waterways and other kind of conservation practices uh, where, the sh where the share of it is uh, offset, but the farm stays in production. A similar working lands policy is the CSP program, and this one got a little bit more attention and caused some of the controversy and challenges in this last and the 2018 Farm Bill. Again, we're looking at acres and obligations as reported by NRCS. The Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP, is working lands, but across the entire farm, and rather than just cost share, it is an annual contract payment. So you're going to go into NRCS and sign up for this program. You have to achieve a certain level of conservation to get into the program to qualify, and then you're in for five years. And every year, you're, each of those five years, you're receiving an annual contract payment from NRCS in return for maintaining the conservation that got you into the program and improving it across the entire farm. Now, that obviously can be a very complex process. And of course, the paperwork can be no small amount of challenge. But we're looking to see conservation on working lands that extends beyond individual practices but touches the entire farm. One of the things that we've seen as a big challenge of this program is that uh, in dealing with lease land, of course, if you lose that lease or how you work across multiple landlords. There have been attempts to uh, improve that at the agency level and in the 2018 Farm Bill. I think more remains to be seen on how that's going to work. But it is a challenge in a program of, uh, with this uh, uh, type of policy goal and the level of complexity that we work through. So look, we had conservation in the 80s at a time when we're in the middle of farm crisis but struggling politically as well. And these conservation pressures have not decreased. We continue to see them. In fact, I would say they're growing. Conservation pressures now uh, we're seeing expand from things like consumers and concerns throughout the food chain. Do we see sustainable production? Can I guarantee that the food that I buy has been produced in a way that's sustainable or that meets certain criteria uh, from what I want to see uh, in the production side of that? Everything from the water quality issues at the Gulf of Mexico, from drainage issues, from nutrient soil loss, uh, on and on and on, uh, issues that we know we're very familiar with in Ohio, right? So these pressures are not just new, but they are certainly not going away. In fact, they are growing and are going to continue to drive much of the political and policy discussion as we work on farm bills. So as we think about the programs that we have that interact with farmers in this farm bill, this is the total base acres that receive payments from the Title I program as reported by FSA, it was discussed by Dr. Westhoff. Here's crop insurance with that growth into the 300 million acre category. There's conservation. And this is not to pick on conservation, but this is to highlight where we're spending our money and the acres that we are impacting uh, in these programs as compared to the political pressures that we have for a farm bill. Now we've mentioned budget and spending issues. The Congressional Budget, Congressional budget Office, CBO, is our scorekeeper in Congress. They're the ones that tell us what they think programs are going to spend. And complicating the politics around passing a bill and the challenges of drafting legislation is this idea that CBO is going to tell us what we're going to spend in a series of programs over 10 years. That becomes a baseline that we have to work with. 
And then any changes we want to make in the legislative process have to be offset. So if I want to spend more on conservation programs, I will have to cut from something else. If I want to spend more on Title I programs, I have to cut somewhere else. And so it sets up this tough zero-sum kind of game in the political realm in which interest groups now are not just disagreeing about policy, but those disagreements may come with real uh, consequences in the programs and the spending. So what did the 2018 Farm Bill end up doing in conservation? Well, a couple things that may be good and a few things that raise some real concerns. Right? The CRP and the easement programs, Agriculture Conservation Easement is ASEP, the spending on those programs have, has increased, at least as the way CBO looks at it going forward. They've done so because we've increased acreage in CRP. We've stepped up from the 24 million acre cap over the five-year life of this bill to eventually 27 million acres that can be in CRP. But watch this. In order to pay for that, we had to cut rental rates. So this time, CRP rental rates are now capped at 85% of the county average rental rate for general sign-up and 90% for the continuous sign-up. This is likely to impact not just CRP uh, sign-up, but where those acres exist, because clearly this will push uh, CRP dollars into acres that are, I shouldn't say clearly, my guess is this is going to push uh, CRP dollars into acres that are less expensive. We did see some provisions added in to really focus some assistance, particularly continuous assistance, on water quality for lakes, for estuaries, for rivers, through the continuous and the, and the uh, conservation reserve enhancement programs trying to focus, again, some of this assistance back into the working land categories and back on the water quality challenges that we are really dealing with here in the Midwest. We also increased easement funding. So the increases that we've seen in this farm bill were largely on the side of acres in the, as largely on the side of the acreage retirement programs in CRP and easements. Different story for working lands programs. The House farm bill uh, proposed eliminating the CSP program altogether and somehow blending it in with the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. The Senate pro Farm Bill did not do that. When they worked it out in conference, we have kind of a typical, typical compromise where we've sort of eliminated CSP by moving all the authorities under EQIP. But what may be more important with the change here is that these programs, where CSP used to be an acreage-based program, so each year USDA was instructed to add 10 million acres roughly to the program. Now it sits in one pot of money with EQIP and we're dividing that money across the two programs. It is no longer operating on an acreage basis. So that, I don't know exactly how that's going to change the sign up or how the program operates, but it certainly raises some concerns about what are the implications for revising this program in this way and putting it under the same pot of money as EQIP. Overall, based on CBO scoring, it looks like we're reducing the funding in working lands conservation to some level. Also uh, included in this working lands category is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which we added in 2014. And this one is a new acronym and sort of a new program, but the, really the way it works is on a regional basis across farms, but also across the different working lands title programs. So it uses CSP and EQIP authorities. And this will help, I think, expand or extend some of the funding for working lands. But ultimately, this raises questions. This raises concerns not just about the investment we're making into something as important, both uh, to people, to farmers, and on the ground, but also to those that do not farm that look at uh, our farm practices and ask questions or want to see more sustainability. How are we managing the investment to do that? Well, I borrowed these from uh, uh, Dr. Newton uh, with uh, American Farm Bureau. He put out a neat article just recently about EQIP and CSP that's comparing the two programs. And he put together these maps showing where the acres exist, so you can see Ohio here at roughly 325 uh, million, or 325,000 acres in CSP and 96 in EQIP, right? So now we have these two programs as a single source of funding. We've also added language in there to allow uh, irrigation districts to compete for that funding, which is going to challenge, I think, uh, some of the availability. And it raises a very significant concern, speaking in the Midwest from the Midwest, I think it raises a concern for us in the Midwest. What is this going to do to the conservation investment on our farms in this part of the country? How is this going to play out? And what is the impact as we're also uh, struggling with things like water quality challenges? In a similar vein, we look at the funding uh, map comparison. You can see, again, uh, where, where the funds have been divvied up or allocated, I should say, where the funds have been allocated to the states uh, using this map. And so we're going to be watching closely how this works. So the big announcement recently uh, is that NRCS is now taking applications for CSP. 
So this is a moment uh, when farmers can go in and sign up for the program, see if they qualify. Applications are open until May the 10th. And what they have announced is not major changes, at least that, that I can tell in how the program's gonna operate, other than uh, there's no basic change in the, in the payment range, although we see an increase for cover cropping and for resource conserving crop rotation. So if you're thinking about those kind of practices, get into your NRCS office and ask about what's available and see if your farm can qualify and get in this program. If for no other reason we want to certainly see uh, an increase in demand for this kind of assistance, uh, particularly from the Midwest, and help to offset any challenges that changes in the bill might result in. So if we take a moment again to kind of place our current discussion, coming back into my argument a little bit more, how have we dealt with conservation and these challenges with natural resources over time? Well, I've mentioned a, a few of these, right? We know that in the Dust Bowl era, uh, we had massive problems, largely concentrated in the Western Plains, and the stories coming out of the Dust Bowl are, are difficult and hard to imagine the level of challenge that we had. The policy response largely was taking acres out of production. Uh, the response was trying to pay farmers to reseed those acres that had been plowed up for wheat. As we expanded acres again in the 70s, uh, in the 70s, largely during the target price era, uh, post the big spike with uh, early 1970s changes in both monetary policy and trade policy. We saw expanded acres, a push for farmers to increase the acres they controlled, you know, the old get big or get out, the fence row to fence row mentality that we saw in the Nixon administration in the 70s, resulting uh, or largely leading up to the crisis in the 80s and this return of erosion challenges and this return of CRP and acreage reduction policy, as well as the addition of compliance policy on farmers. And I still say this is an incredibly significant uh, moment in history when you think of it during the depths of the farm crisis that, our, that Congress agreed in policy to uh, put, those, uh, put those payments on an eligibility basis determined by conservation. So as farmers were in the middle of the crisis, we changed policy and added compliance. So this is, gives you an idea of just how big the political move and how important that coalition was at the time. So as we step into current era, we're in this RFS era, if you will, this time of, again, expanded acres, expanded pro production, very large crops with the genetic engineered seeds and our ability to, to uh, uh, produce more and more that we need, even with an RFS, a renewable fuel standard in place. And what we're seeing now is another massive natural resource challenge, and that's water quality. I, I'm standing in Ohio, I need to talk too much about water quality challenges. We think of Western Lake Erie and the struggles uh, with the community like Toledo and the politics and, and challenges around uh, water quality. And think about the story that, that sort of reverberates in the, in the discussions around this country when we think about large communities that have to buy water because they can't drink the water coming out of the lake. These things cause us real problems they also cause us real political problems. And they raise the question about how are we gonna deal with, with conservation challenges in this era of this scale. But more importantly, when it was the Dust Bowl, these were acres that we'd put into production that we took out of production. In the nutrient loss era, we're talking about some of the most productive fertile farmland in the world. We're talking about high, uh, high cost, expensive farmland, much of it tile drained, that's losing this, these nitrogen, these nutrients. This is not the same conservation challenge as the Dust Bowl. So are, are, are our policies up to the task? And do we need to rethink these a little bit and start thinking through not just conservation, but a more complete risk picture, if you will? What do we know is, is the big driving, you know, the, the topic du jour of the 2014 Farm Bill that was the, was the issue of risk. In 2018, it's the issue of risk. That part of the conversation is not gonna change. We're gonna continue to hear concerns about risk and we're gonna to continue to watch as we not only deal with weather risk, but climate risk. Risk to yields, but the nutrient challenge that we have. How do our policies adapt to that? We look at yield loss, we, we think about crop insurance and the incredible work we've done over time to build that program up, to get high participation in most of the major commodities, and to see actuarial soundness and policies that work uh, for the farmer but also in times like we've seen with good years, good crop years, when that spending comes down because we're not seeing the loss at the farm level, this is a program that adjusts to the risks and the realities. How do we think about that when we deal with something uh, of the scale and scope of say the Gulf hypoxic zone, 
which is driving policy changes in Illinois right now where we see a big push for nutrient loss reduction and for the last four to five years. We've seen farmers trying to find and adapt and adopt new practices to cut that nutrient loss as this pressure comes up out of the Gulf and I would also add from local communities. We saw a lawsuit in Iowa uh, in Des Moines over drainage districts that was, and another one that was just filed recently. So we will start to see these challenges build and build and build and we need policy that adapts to those challenges and thinks of it in terms of risk. Why? So here's my other attempt uh, to the economists in the room. This is my attempt to, to do a little economics work. Bear with me, right? If this is the value of our corn, uh, revenue value, yield, and price, our operating costs, our overhead costs, well, you can start to see the underwater challenges, right? If we add conservation costs on top of that, we're now adding challenges to that farmer particularly at a time when we're dealing with revenue uh, risk as well, right? We're complicating this picture for the farmer trying to do the policies we need to see uh, on the larger, uh, the larger space uh, on water, on politics. We may be putting these farmers at a competitive disadvantage. This might be an investment. If it's an investment in soil health, it might be one that's going to take time to pay off. How does that farmer compete on, say, cash rent with somebody who's willing to pay more for cash rent in a, in a time when you're struggling to, uh, to make ends meet to begin with. What happens in that situation where you've spent three or four years uh, trying to build up that soil health and you lose the rent, you lose the lease, right? These challenges not only complicate uh, the policy, but they complicate our real world actions. So what happens in those cases? How do we think about our policies that deal with these realities of working lands and farm production and farm risk? I wish I had that answer, I don't. But I think if we started to look at our farm bill and particularly the three buckets that deal with farmers directly, here's our spending bars. Uh, as reported by CBO back in January, the red bars are Title I program payments. You'll see the spike uh, dealing with the market facilitation program that came out because of the tariff and trade. So we see a massive spike in spending there. We see our crop insurance in blue and our spending and conservation there in green. Set aside the dollars for a second. What else do you see here? You see three different programs, three different acronyms operated by three different agencies within USDA, largely serving the same farmers. Can we begin to think of policies that think of conservation, not just in natural resource issues, but also in terms of the price or revenue risk that the farmer faces and the challenges in the, in the management side of that question, the financial management of that farm? Can we start to think across these bars and think of ways that these two programs or these three areas can work together better? Can we think of insurance payments, and I know this can make some of us nervous, given the experience with conservation compliance, but can we think outside of the compliance bucket and start to think about how our insurance and our farm program payments better blend in conservation as we go, that we're helping with that competitive disadvantage that some of these farmers may be facing, or that we're helping with the short-term investment challenges that might come with that. And if I wanted to be provocative, I'd ask this question, because I've gotten asked this question. With all this money spent on farmers, What's the return on investment for the taxpayer? What are we doing outside of the farmer? Where, if I'm not in farming, where do I see the most return on the money spent? Is it in crop insurance? Is it in farm programs? Or is it in conservation? Do these sort of questions help drive us to rethink some of our policies and push forward, because it's never too early to start thinking about the next farm bill, about how we might start pushing some of these discussions and maybe, maybe just maybe working across those titles. That's my argument. I'll stick with it for at least a little bit longer. I'll also make a shameless plug for the book that I put out. If you really like history and farm bills, um, it came out in uh, December. It's from University of Nebraska Press. And you know, if, if you really want to run through 100 years of farm bill history, here it is, uh, the fault line. So listen, thanks again, Ben and Sam and everybody for having me back. And I uh, look forward to the questions here in a little bit. Thank you.